Toto? I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. The, uh, stuff that dreams are made of. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. He's looking at you, kid. Well, nobody's perfect. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Hello and welcome to Revisiting the Golden Age, a journey through classic Hollywood podcast brought to you by the Inside the Film Room Podcast Network. I'm your host, Josh Martin. Welcome back. If you're a returning listener, this is episode four of Revisiting the Golden Age. And today we are actually talking about a film that is not quite Golden Age Hollywood. It exists a little bit outside. So uh, we are talking about The Lady Vanishes, Alfred Hitchcock's 1938 film, uh, one of his last produced in Britain. Joining me today to talk about Hitchcock's classic film is Jesse Nussman, a writer for Film Inquiry and the host of Film Inquiry's little latest podcast. Jesse, thanks for coming back on the show. Hello. Oh, thank thank you for having me. Two two time. Am I the first official two timers? You are the you were the first official two timer guest. Yes. Do I get a jacket? Uh, that's not in the budget, unfortunately. Oh, I wish, I dang. wish I could, I wish I could get a jacket, but a pin. Uh, Do I at least get like a pin that I could put on my shirt? Sure. Maybe I'll make those down the line. Maybe I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll take the little logo Zach made for, uh, Zach made for the show, and I'll put it on pins and send it out to all the guests. But yes, if you are a new listener, this is Jesse's second time on the show. Uh, he joined me for episode one when we talked about. Leo McCary's Duck Soup, which was a fun discussion where we talked about sort of the past, present, and future of uh, Hollywood comedy. In this case, um, it's a little bit of a uh, a different story and a different film. Um, When I first started this podcast, I was like, will I do films from outside America? Will I not? I quickly just accepted that, um, you know, in thinking about international cinema during this period and its influence on Hollywood, uh, it would be very silly to sort of restrict myself to um, strictly films that come from the studio system, in part because the director we're talking about today, Alfred Hitchcock, is probably one of the most famous Hollywood filmmakers, if not the most famous of all time. So yeah, I guess just to, to kick off this conversation, um, what are your thoughts on uh, The Lady Vanishes? Uh was this your first time seeing it? And uh, how do you feel sort of about its placement in Hitchcock's filmography more generally? Yeah. So I guess, uh, you know, to elaborate, I, I, I de- technically didn't watch this movie for this podcast yeah. out of like, I I've been watching a lot of um, Hitchcock movies of late. And um, cause you know, there, there were a bunch, I don't know how many are on anymore, but there were a bunch that were on Peacock and i will say if you have the criterion collection or you know the criterion channel uh they got a great like british hitchcock um collection there that's basically like a bunch of the movies he did like in the 1930s over in the uk and this is a part of that so i had never seen this before um and i'm gonna be upright I kind of don't remember much of like the plot details, but I like, you know, that this is like a weird thing with me and Hitchcock movies. Like if you ask me to like describe to you the plot of, I don't know, let's say like the birds or vertigo, like I'm, I'm not going to be much of a help to you. Like, like I, I, I saw rewatched the birds recently with my girlfriend for like, you know, a, a fun Halloween movie. And I don't think I could tell you, hardly anything that happened like you know the the plot mechanics of that movie but i can you know pretty accurately describe sort of the style and sort of aesthetic pleasure of 
experiencing one of his movies, which I think is um is part of why I really like Hitchcock so much. I mean, who who doesn't like Hitchcock? Yeah. If if you don't like Hitchcock, then like a a, <laughs> a shame to you and of just like I don't know why you deny yourself the pleasure and the fun of his movies. Um but yeah, I think of like where this fits in his filmography. I think it's interesting. Like when I, when I watched it, I kind of turned to my girlfriend and said, "I I feel like this is sort of a warm up movie for him. Like it's it's very fun and um, entertaining, and I was never bored watching it. But I I don't know about you. I'm much more of a fan of the kind of like this is like a pretty efficient and like well made mystery thriller." But I much prefer the more kind of like surreal and cerebral Hitchcock movies, um, which kind of come after this period. I I, I feel like this is a yeah. movie that I think of in very technical terms, and I think is a fun um, a fun movie just to watch, like a great kind of work for hire director. Which I don't mean is like a backhanded comment to him, but th- this is him kind of just in like. I'm going to do a very kind of like straightforward kind of pop mystery thriller. And it's not the kind of like wild, crazy kind of like multiple layers of kind of like subversion and sort of like surrealism and, and like kind of for lack of a better word, like fucked upness like, I don't know, I rewatched um Notorious recently with my girlfriend and, like, left that movie being like, that movie is really, really messed up and upsetting. <laughs> it just was sort of like, I, 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 like, sold it to her as, like, we're going to watch this, like, sexy spy thriller with um Cary Grant and uh, Ingrid Bergman. And, like, midway through, it was like, wow, this movie is, like, really, really dark and, like, moody and is pretty upsetting to watch and is, like really tragic but um yeah i've kind of gone on a ramble but i i I guess i would consider this like fun but not essential hitchcock if that makes any sense yeah absolutely and um no i think it's really interesting that you mentioned at the start um of what you were saying there about the fact that you don't really remember the plot of hitchcock's films um in part because that's you know that's something that uh jean-luc godard comments on in uh, one of the chapters of his sort of eight part East du cinema he makes this sort of extensive monologue about how you know we don't really remember why anything happens in Hitchcock films um, but we remember the objects and the different sort of uh, like you were talking about sort of individual stylistic and sensory details of the films and yeah that's absolutely part of it and probably I mean I just watched this film yesterday so I still have the plot somewhat fresh in my mind but it's certainly not what lingers and it, it is probably to the, i don't know if the plot really matters in this film um and that might be part of the reason why it hasn't really uh lingered in your in your mind much because um you know it it is this spy plot i guess to sub, to give both a, a a description of this film and a description of where it fits in hitchcock's career hitchcock's career has sort of three or f- i would say four broad movements uh, he starts in England in the uh, in the end, England in the UK in the 1920s and 30s. Um, starts in silent films. Eventually um, makes some of his best sort of work in the sound era. There, um, you mentioned the the British Hitchcock series on Criterion. Yeah, this is one of those films, and I believe the other two films in that series are the first version with Peter Laura of uh, the Man Who Knew Too Much, as well as the oh, 30. 30- also, really fun. Yeah. Watch that recently. I haven't, really I, haven't, I haven't seen that one. I need to watch both versions of that. That's one of my remaining Hitchcock blind spots. The other film in that series is The 39 Steps, which uh, I, to describe that briefly, is kind of like a proto North by Northwest, at least how that's yeah. sort of acknowledged it's, it's in kind scholarship. Of the, yeah, it's kind of the British North by Northwest is how I've always thought of it. Also, really fun movie. Yeah. Hitchcock? yeah good yeah. director <laughs> no absolutely yeah i um 
And so Lady Vanishes is one of the last films, if not the last, I'm not entirely 100% certain on this, before he moves into the second portion of his career, which is the sort of David O. Selznick pictures in America, Rebecca wins Best Picture, he goes on and makes a ton more stuff, uh, some of the greatest films of all time, and the rest is history, and I will get to, as this series progresses, we will get to many more Hitchcock films. This film itself... um, it's a very strange film and a very interesting film in terms of its structure. So it begins, um, I believe it's set somewhere near the Swiss Alps. Uh, there's a, everybody is on a train ride, um, but they're snowed in. So we get this marvelous and wonderfully Hitchcocky and opening shot of this model town. And you can see the train is being, has been stopped by the snow and you go through, I mean, it's very clearly a model, but who doesn't love old, film models anyways Mm -hmm. there's this sort of large ensemble of characters you have these two british gentlemen who um are really only interested in making it back for their cricket match you have a young woman who's about to be uh, married to a man um you have her sort of um annoying or, or initial sort of uh combatant who becomes eventually her sort of romantic interest and and uh lover you have uh and you have an older woman uh the film the first 25 30 minutes of it and it's only a 96 minute film are all set in this like inn that they're all stuck in um and they can't there's not really enough space and so it's not quite like a hangout film it's not quite a siege film but it does still have present this sort of extended time and space for us to get to know these characters in this really strange and peculiar way that's distinct even in Hitchcock's filmography. The plot really kicks into motion when um, the, uh, they're finally able to leave on the train. They go back to London. Um, the main character, Iris, um, is uh, speaks with this woman, Miss Froy, um, who eventually goes missing. And uh, Iris is hit on the head by something at the start of the movie. Uh, or near the start of the movie. And so there's all this sort of question of, is she, you know, does she know what she's saying? Does she like completely with it? Um, we're fairly certain we're fairly aligned with her viewing position. Um, but Miss Froy goes missing and everyone's like, there was no Miss Froy on this train. And we end up in this sort of convoluted spy plot. The uh, person that was previously uh, her foil uh, ends up and the main character is played by Margaret Lockwood. The main, the, person who was originally her foil ends up being her uh, love interest and her partner in this mystery solving. Um, And it ends up in this sort of, uh, you know, odd mode where uh, we're sort of finding out details bit by bit. It's very Hitchcock, very um, interesting in a lot of ways. And possibly the most interesting thing about this film um, is that there seems to be of two critical minds of it. Um, you know, I was reading uh, different reviews and commentary from critics and uh, like I was reading the Criterion essay from this film back when the DVD came out. And, you know, I, in line with what you're talking about a little bit is that a lot of critics have sort of positioned this as just like a, a fun sort of uh, diversion for Hitchcock Um Robin Wood in the talking about North by Northwest uses the term light entertainment and people sort of apply that same terminology here. Um, But then there's a sort of different critical perspective on this that I found in reading um, either um, K. Austin Collins, I believe says something about this on uh, Letterboxd. If you follow um, some of the, uh, the great critics on one of of my favorite critics, yeah, as well as I think Mike D'Angelo talks about it as well, um, is that they sort of describe it as this intensely political film, which it, it isn't off that isn't often mentioned by um, by the the critics who sort of view it as a lighter entertainment. Um, and in that sense, the politics that are seen to be in play are um, a sort of parable of sorts about anti isolationism or sort of the uh british resistance around this sort of pre-war period the film comes out in 1938 so uh, hitler is really sort of knocking on the doorsteps of europe and fascism is really starting to sort of uh explode into the conflict that would obviously become world war ii um and so we have this film that sort of exists as potentially 
this sort of light entertainment that Hitchcock makes that's really fun and delightful and maybe not uh, his top shelf work. Or as some other critics see it, we have this sort of uh, film that's masquerading as that while also being this sort of political parable. And Hitchcock's films are always doing, as I think some of the reviews indicate, uh, multiple films at the same time. But I was curious on your thoughts on this and and what you had maybe read about the film or thought about uh, since you watched it. Yeah, I mean, I've I've obviously just because I'm like a huge fan of <laughs> I'm I'm a huge fan of uh I I hope I'm not being too casual and the you know referring to him like this of of Cam Collins um and of just like as one of those critics I just like absolutely admire and like think I know about movies and then I like read something he writes and it like completely rewires my brain and I'm just like I'm a fucking idiot <laughs> and. <laughs> And and so like I I've obviously I, I follow him on Letterbox and have read his take on it, which I I think that's certainly a very interesting read on it. And I think particularly the two, um, you know, the two British characters that you mentioned being this very like stiff upper lip kind of like British aristocrat um, type of character, and. You know, there's so much reluctance in the movie, I think, to kind of get involved in the central mystery and the the sort of lead woman who is kind of going around car to car and is like, there is a woman who is on this train that now I can't find. And I literally just had a conversation with her and everyone's kind of just like kind of like scoffing her off. And that i i don't know i think that's a really fascinating and interesting read considering the time this was made in um weirdly i think the thing i i was thinking of of just sort of like this as kind of a piece of light entertainment that the thing that interested me was the idea of this kind of being hitchcock's agatha christie movie like i thought a lot about murder on the orient express um just because of like a train obviously but you know that kind of setup that you mentioned where they're all kind of hanging out in the hotel like that's that's a very agatha christie setup and you are sort of watching it like okay when is this going to um i don't know when is this going to progress when are we going to kind of get the the engine of the plot moving yeah but it is sort of very slyly i think setting you up in sort of like very delicately like pushing your attention towards these very key players that like once you get on this train you know exactly who everyone is and what everyone's kind of little thing is and then the drama can kind of just unfold naturally because you've already had that kind of table setting beforehand and that that is a very like agatha christie thing and i find that sort of formally interesting because um Hitchcock hated Agatha Christie, which like I don't I don't know how much knowledge he would have had of her, like or or like what his thoughts of her would have been at this phase in his career, because this is still fairly early in his career. But like the idea of this kind of being his take on that kind of story, I find very interesting. Um, you know, when you mentioned that kind of opening sequence, like you know, there's just so many moments in this movie and i think you know the uh the man who wasn't there um or no sorry the man who knew too much yes correct yes sorry there's a bill murray movie that has like a very very similar title that i always get the two confused like even to this day um so if if i screw up the title of that movie it's because there's a bill murray movie that i was forced to watch as a child that's really <laughs> terrible and you shouldn't see but has a like almost identical title and it like has messed me up since i was 12 um but i think of that movie and this movie as these pairs of like you know these very kind of like i i still think i think the political read of it is interesting and fascinating um but for me like viewing this as sort of a light entertainment work by him there's just so many moments kind of in both of those movies where he doesn't need to flex, but he's flexing. Like yeah. that moment that you mentioned with like the zoom in and like the, this little like mountainside town, he doesn't need to do that. 
yeah. but like there's and and there's so many sequences in in the other movie that i mentioned that like he's just sort of coming up with these like it, it almost reminds me of kind of what someone like i don't know steven soderbergh some i i feel like is a filmmaker who sometimes does this of like i'm gonna take and not try to like overthink the script but i'm gonna think of like where's a moment where i can do like a really creative shot that's really like outside the box and this is i think a fun moment in hitchcock's career where he's not he's just trying to entertain you um i mean he's always been a master class entertainer but i feel like he's he's not trying to sort of like dig for some sort of like deeper thematic material but he is sort of like being very acutely aware from this very like formal standpoint of like where's a moment where i could do a little bit more than what is asked of me there's so many moments in this movie um particularly on the train there's just so many moments that I feel like he's doing really inventive effects work for the time that he doesn't have to do. I mean, there's like so many movies from this time period where like someone's not going to go through the, the effort of doing these very like elaborate effects where like stuff is moving in the background and people are on the train or like people are moving from compartments or like poking their heads outside the train and like stuff is whooshing past you um i don't know i i I think of this as kind of like an interesting tease of i think the great director he would become of you know he's not putting a lot of sort of subversive or like layered thought into necessarily the, the thematic ideas of the movie but he is thinking a lot about like what's the most creative and engaging way that I can kind of display this seemingly kind of conventional story, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think it might be partially because I uh, glanced around at the, the reviews by um, Collins and, and Mike D'Angelo before seeing it. So I kind of went in with some of the sort of political elements in mind. Um, and I think I would probably myself push more towards both the fact that um, I do think, you know, obviously like some of the the stuff that he makes, especially like in the late, you know, for that, that stretch of time from rear window to, um, you know, Psycho or the birds and Marnie and whatever mm-hmm. comes after that is sort of Hitchcock at his peak, but he is sort of still this incredibly formally accomplished filmmaker here. But part of the reason I, I feel that the, that the political read, uh, is necessary is in part because um, on a surface level, I find the story mostly lacking, not necessarily in intrigue, but in much sort of depth. Um, Hitchcock himself seems profoundly uninterested by the story. Um, you know, the the film builds to this climatic set piece. Uh, in one of my my favorite moments, there is this sort of twist reveal where someone on the train who's been uh, uh, you know pretending to be a doctor ends up revealing themselves to be a spy. Um, Which, and it's just you know to to like you know I I just had to point it out because it's it's you know it it feels echoed in another movie I love, but like that's Mission Impossible. Like I don't know when the yeah. last time you saw like the the De Palma Mission Impossible movie, but like it it is that that movie sort of echoes that reveal i feel like from this movie that wait a, there, wait there a second a... wait a second are you telling me brian de palma ripped off hitchcock what, what? <laughs> <laughs> no way no anyway i love de palma i don't yeah, mean yeah. that as a riff i love i love i love i did films. my over the top reaction of just of like <laughs> you know of like that's saying like de palma is like very very acutely like ob- obsessed with like recreating hitchcock is like the most like obvious beat you over the head piece of film criticism uh, ever so like I, d- I don't feel like i'm making like a, a particularly insightful point but i i thought that was a fun little bit that i had to like interject 
when you mentioned like the twist reveal of like when I was watching that, my girlfriend and I were like, Oh, mission impossible. Like that's where he got this from. Oh, absolutely. No, I'm really glad you made that connection. Cause I, I would not have done it. I just had to make the joke about De Palma there because um, if we do do, if I do do more Hitchcock episodes on this show, um, I'm sure that will come up again and again. And I mean, but not necessarily in a bad way. I mean, I love, I love body double. It's like one of my, one of my favorite movies. So De Palma's great movie, De Palma's great. And uh, I'm glad you made that connection. Cause I, I wouldn't have, I haven't seen the first mission impossible in a long time, but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, and another train finding you mentioned murder on the Orient express. Um, Josef von Sternberg's Shanghai express also seems to be in the mix here as a, a sort of potential reference that comes about five or six earlier years earlier in the sort of, uh timeline in the 30s but um the film builds to this um climatic set piece where the the true villain is revealed um who sort of reminds me of philip van dam from um north by northwest much Mm -hmm. like 30 much like 39 steps this is a film that i think is echoed in north by northwest in a lot of ways and um yeah so i mean but it we reach this set piece and it's a shootout between the passengers and the uh, police. And, you know, the moment where I think the film's politics become expressly clear is you have at one point, there's this one guy who really doesn't want to do anything. He's like, no, I, we're, we don't need to do this. I'll go out and reason with them. And of course he's the one who gets killed in the end. So there is certainly uh, some commentary on the appeasement uh, of fascist forces in Europe at the time. Um, but in reality, I think, you know, the answer might be somewhere in between. I don't think Hitchcock cares about the plot. You know, the politics are, are there though. I think, you know, someone could perfectly well enjoy this film without them. Um, you know, there's, I'm in a Hitchcock class this semester. So I'll sometimes like pull things that my professors at different readings have said. So, um, but Hitchcock loves his different, you know, couples and doubles and romantic pairings and, um, you know, this really is about the relationship between the sort of uh, love and hate relationship between our two principal protagonists. Another film that reminded me of that I think, you know, this film, uh, a film from 1963, um, Charade, directed by Stanley Donan, mm. with Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn. Um, and, you know, that's a film that's commonly and frequently said to be sort of... Um, a, a way of, of ripping off Hitchcock, but specifically North by Northwest. That is a film that's obviously in play with that film. But, you know, more that the more that I thought about it, I was like, you know, this kind of has a similar feel as well. Um, a lighter film in a lot of ways and a more sort of uh, at times innocent and playful one, though. Uh, I certainly, I think Hitchcock was perhaps um, more liberty or liberated with direct, sort of uh, sexual overtones and innuendos in the British films than perhaps in some of the American, though that's not to say that the, all Mm -hmm. of the Hitchcock films from, you know, I mean, yeah, all of them, even in the studio system were still explicitly sexual in nature and Freudian in nature. Um, Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you're going to cover the birds on this, on the, on this series but let me tell you after like having rewatched the birds i mean i i don't the birds might be about like the dangers of like tr- trying to get yourself some d you know what i mean <laughs> like <laughs> yeah no i mean every one of hitchcock's films presents a sort of multiplicity of potential interpretations and the birds is perhaps his sort of most daring rorschach test in which you could you know talk about that film as a um you know about the the perils of uh of you know anti-communist or mccarthyism you can talk about it as a parable for sort of sexual dysfunction and so yeah i mean you have all these sort of um motifs and themes that reappear in hitchcock's films throughout his career um one of the ones that i thought was most interesting in its reappearance here is um Hitchcock is famous for um, uh, coding many characters uh, in his films as implicitly queer. Obviously, you couldn't have any openly gay characters in um, classic Hollywood films because of the the strict production code. And I imagine it was the same in Britain. Um, yeah. But here we get that sort of um, the the male couple in which, yeah, I mean, their role plays into the politics of the film. 
um, as sort of, uh, like you said, these, these sort of proper British gentlemen who really only care about their cricket match and don't care about the drama that's going on in front of them until they're forced to, to take up their weapons. Um, but there's also so much playful humor that even goes beyond what Hitchcock does in a lot of the American films. I mean, they're, they're pictured in bed at one point. Um, they have to sleep in the maid's office and the maid or the maid's office or chambers. And uh, the maid is supposed to come in and change when they're in there, but they like go outside. Like they really don't have like any sexual interest in her. Um, so it's fun to see where Hitchcock sort of a lot of these themes and motifs that he would bring up end up starting in the British films. Um, you know, particularly there's like I alluded to earlier, there's this sort of great dramatic irony at different points where, um, he, you know, sort of shuffles around our own point of view and associations. You know, at one point we're with uh, the main character and sort of in her subject position later, uh, you know, we briefly get this acknowledgement from the villains of like, ah, okay, now we know what's going on and we sort of have this more omniscient view. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I obviously wouldn't put this film, you know, on the level with Vertigo or Psycho or Rear Window or North by Northwest, or, I mean, you know, the dude made a litany of masterpieces. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to, <laughs> to make every film psycho, but um, I found this film really sort of really entertaining and um, uh, it moves really well. Uh, it opens up some sort of fun passages for experimentation and it sort of is a fun test case for the different things that, um, uh, that Hitchcock would do throughout the rest of his career. And as we've noted, um, even though it sort of predates North by Northwest, which is more commonly seen as the sort of reference in different films, um, it is sort of a, perhaps a frequent quotation in and of itself in anything from uh, Mission Impossible to uh, Charade to all of these films. And it, it is fun to see Hitchcock's style, which is, you know, so distinctive and so, um, so much the foundation of, you know, Hollywood cinema and especially the thriller and mystery genre in general. Uh, fun to see that at work in the, uh, in the British films. And I enjoyed this one actually a good deal more than uh, the 39 steps. I remember watching that and being perhaps a little underwhelmed by it, though perhaps also not adequately prepared for the sort of stylistic differences between the British and American films. And so, uh, yeah, though I, I found this one pretty uh, engaging and uh, thought provoking and entertaining throughout. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think to kind of like wrap up my thoughts. I mean, I I I think these British movie. I think the Lady Vanishes kind of as like a piece in a collection of all these kind of early British movies that he did, like The Man Who Knew Too Much, um, and The Thirty Nine Steps. I I think it's kind of a fun trial run um you know the, these movies i think for any other filmmaker are kind of like <laughs> i feel like we'd kind of go like holy shit like wow they did it well that's like someone's apex right there yeah you know but i i, I feel like this is him kind of all all these movies i think you're very wise in sort of pointing out are kind of like laying bedrocks for ideas that he can either like make grander. I, th I think the, the meta-ness and the sort of baggage that you bring with sort of bigger movie stars, like a Cary Grant or like um, a Grace Kelly or a Jimmy Stewart, but or or even just sort of like make dirtier as much as sort of like Hitchcock could like make his movies dirtier under like the stricter codes during classic Hollywood. But I, I think they are movies that let him kind of push his sort of formal craftsmanship. Um, you know, it, it's interesting thinking about someone like, you know, uh, David Fincher, for example, who I like when I first think of a David Fincher movie, um, not just sort of like obviously the first thing I think of is David Fincher's incredible interview where he says all people are perverts and that's the th basis that I've built my entire career around. But the second thing I think of with David Fincher is just like this incredible like technical knowledge 
yeah. and that's the kind of filmmaker i feel like we see on display with like lady vanishes or man who knew too much or 39 steps is just like an incredible technician at work and then sort of through these kind of very pop british thrillers i think is finding ways to sort or sort of like passing by kind of ideas and themes that he can then come back to and can with sort of more experience and more technical knowledge make into something as as i said earlier kind of grander or dirtier and I, I I think there is I don't know there there's a fascination I have in sort of rewatching a lot of these earlier movies of his where I get sort of a, a basic movie pleasure out of them, but also it's it's like a fun Rosetta Stone way of kind of like tracing back a lot of his ideas and seeing how they would evolve into movies that have more of a personal connection to me or that I think of maybe more than yeah. I do sort of uh some of these earlier british ones um that that i i I think it's kind of on their service or sort of like fun disposable entertainment and maybe like disposable is a too harsh of a word but you know there's a lot of craft on they're they're well crafted and i think they sort of seed the ideas for a lot of what would become his focal point and what would define a lot of what we think of as like canonical Hitchcock works, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. We've sort of discussed tracing the stylistic lineage here a little bit and, and certainly like the part of the sort of foundation of Hitchcock auteurism and auteurism more generally is this sort of notion of tracing different things in each film. I mean, even like the opening shot of this film that we've sort of discussed with this sort of wonderful tracking shot through this model village uh, and then into the inn where all the characters are located, um, you know, resembles uh, the opening shot of Psycho in some ways where we sort of exist in this sort of um, space where we're only seen through the gaze of the camera before pushing into that window and then boom, we're with Marion Crane and off we go. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I would always necessarily say like uh, that these films are, you know, Hitchcock's career had up and downs. I mean, he made um, sort of great films in all different periods and then films that are considered lesser Hitchcock, though I've always found with with few exceptions. I mean, there's films of Hitchcock's that I wasn't overly fond of when I first watched them, but... Um, the the lesser ones have moments. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give him that of like, I, I am willing to, you know, there there are plenty, I'm sure, like you that do not work for me, but at least have like one or two scenes or sequences in them that I, I I think the lesser ones, if I don't like them, it's only because like their best moments give, um, I think hint at a better movie. Yeah. And I think like, almost like you said, like lesser Hitchcock is almost, um, a conundrum in itself of, is there really such a thing? I mean, um, obviously there's films that we like less, but I mean, even something like I I've seen, I watched for the first time this year as well, Dial M for Murder, which I know some people think of as like lesser Hitchcock or sort of Hitchcock in, uh, autopilot mode. Um, where, that movie's a blast. Those whereas, people are idiots. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> I find that film utterly fascinating on every level in which Hitchcock sort of experimented with, you know, the implication of the spectator going back to your comment from Fincher about all, you know, all viewers are perverts, absolutely correct. And, you know, the sort of uh, a wonderful, that film being a wonderful companion piece to, to Rear Window uh, on a technical level, I, I think that film is, is a marvel. And so, you know, there was a, a prompt, I think, on Twitter a while ago that was like, name your five favorite Hitchcock films. And basically everyone had uh, different lists and so i could very uh, easily see what what what's your favorite I, I hate to interrupt but i mean if we're talking hitchcock i gotta know what the josh martin favorite is yeah i mean my favorite hitchcock film is uh we actually we talked about this on uh, our last podcast as well um about the fact that i've sort of gone through a wonderful and strange journey with vertigo where i first watched it when i was 10 yeah. or so no, i wasn't 10 i was 12 or 13 and i wasn't a fan um, and I've watched it now or, you know, multiple times. And I, I truly do believe that it is the pinnacle of his work and, uh, and my favorite of his films. Um, you know, that's 
the basic choice. I mean, it's like considered the greatest film of all time now in the I, sight and sound. I know. I, I, I hate saying that's my favorite too, just because it's, I feel like I want to be like original and say something else. And I mean, there's so many of his movies that I like, but I, yeah, yeah. I probably agree with everything you say of like, <laughs> it's such a, like, it's such the kind of obvious, like beat you over the head choice, but like, it's, it's that good yeah i mean psycho was the one that i was uh, that i loved as a as a sort of young teenager um but the two that i sort of i think well and also rear window which i've had to watch for like three or four film classes at unc it seems to be a favorite and uh, for obvious reasons but i adore rear window north by northwest is is a marvel strangers on a train has some phenomenal moments um you know I'm sure we'll we'll talk about many of these films, and I'm actually excited to revisit Notorious. I watched that for a film class my oh. freshman year. I remember nothing of it, but that is a film that I will be tackling um, it, when we when it, we get to the it, 1940s. Yeah, it is. That movie's fucked up. <laughs> I, I hate to say this. I hate to be like that vulgar and blunt and kind of like basic on this podcast, but like that as someone who watched that like two weeks ago, that movie's that movie's fucked up <laughs> i am excited to take a look back at that and uh and yeah no i mean the lady vanishes is, is certainly in a, a a less um disturbing register for hitchcock though it clearly sort of plays around with stuff that um in his sort of early period here when you know looking at the bridge as this if you want to look at this film as the bridge from his uh you know british period to the selznick period i mean you could certainly make that case um especially considering that this film rebecca and then suspicion all have um you know female protagonists and female leads who uh are sort of our central uh sort of association um we're associated with their sort of viewing point and subjectivity as viewers um and you know it's very fascinating to see how those films position those characters as you know in their surroundings and how they react to different sort of strange events that are happening um you know this film sort of validates uh margaret lockwood's character's position and her suspicions um the joan fontaine character in hitchcock's suspicion not quite um so yeah i mean it's it's always interesting to place hitchcock's films within this sort of greater body of work um and i was really uh really overjoyed to experience the lady vanishes as another sort of chapter in that. And uh, especially coinciding with the, uh, with the class I've been taking. So um, yeah, well, so thanks for coming on Jesse and talking about this. Yeah. And uh, I, I was, uh, this was a fun conversation and uh, I'm looking forward to more as I think we push forward to the 1940s next month. Um, I think you'll be back to talk about Howard Hawks, uh howard hawks is the big sleep which i'm very excited to talk about that one i'm so excited to to finally have an excuse to watch it yeah no absolutely (laughs) so uh you you know we mentioned last time i think uh we talked about uh your podcast the latest on uh, film inquiry Uh, you mentioned the sorkin episode any new episodes the viewers should be on the lookout for or checking out uh a new episode for (laughs) you and i had you on a recent episode to talk about um, you know the state the state of a nation and um to talk about borat and to talk about david byrne and american utopia and you know just encourage everyone out there to go vote so yes. That, that, yes. That's the latest episode that I was on. I will. Uh, I will second our uh, message from my other uh, my guest appearance on the latest this week. But yes, uh, this episode will be coming out in I believe two days from now, uh, from when we're recording. So the election will not be over yet. So uh, you know, take your chance. You know, take 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 the opportunity now. Go go vote. And uh, and yeah. So um, but looking forward to hearing our conversation. Although I probably won't because I hate hearing my own voice uh, I any more than I have to for uh, recording this podcast. But um, yeah, so uh, thanks for coming on. And I'm looking forward to our other conversation soon. And so, um, yeah, to all the listeners out there, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, next week, I'll be having uh, Jesse and I's good friend, Jordan Snyder, on to talk about the 
Disney classics, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I'm really Ooh. looking forward. Yeah, should be a fun one. I am looking forward to that conversation and uh, more episodes coming soon on all kinds of films from the 1930s. Uh, we're pushing forward now and uh, we're getting closer to the 1940s. Um, but hope you've enjoyed the podcast series so far. Uh, you can follow Jesse on Twitter and, uh, and Letterbox and check out his work uh, at Film Inquiry. Uh, and check out the latest Film Inquiry podcast. You can follow me on Twitter and Letterbox at Martin on Movies. Uh, check out my work at Film Inquiry Inside the Film Room uh, and Aspect, UNC's new undergraduate journal of film and media studies. You can find all that information on my Twitter page. Follow Inside the Film Room. Uh, give us a review on this podcast if you're enjoying it so far. Uh, but yeah, that's all I have for today. So I hope you enjoyed our breakdown of Hitchcock's The Lady Vanishes, and I will see you next time. Mm-hmm.